gracious God, teacher God, open our hearts and make us willing to learn from those who have gone before. Amen. <clears throat> Seek the Lord and live. So says the prophet Amos at the start of our first reading. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Yet we have a great high priest who understands our weakness and guides and teaches us by his word, proclaimed to us through the Gospels. It is Jesus who makes it possible for us to approach God despite our human limitations, and it is in worship that we find God waiting. Worship is an act of devotion, of adoration, reverence, and honor. In our religious context, worship is the expression of our individual and corporate relationship with God. No matter where we worship, no matter how we shape liturgy, scripture is at the center. It is not just the gospel, but the readings of the Old and New Testaments, the psalm, our prayers, our hymns, our sermons and sacraments. All are shaped by scripture. Look back at the opening hymn when you have a moment. To plowshare beat the sword, to pruning hook the spear. The text is from Isaiah. In worship, we hear God's word and God hears ours. In our prayers especially, but also in the words of our hearts unspoken, in the tears that come unbidden, in the burdens we carry, and the joy that makes us so vulnerable. In worship, we come before God asking forgiveness, accepting grace, and knowing that we are loved. Here in this place, we come before God with a chance to be changed. In the gospel, we meet a man who asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I preached on this text not long ago, and my attention was on this critical question. Do any of us make time in our daily lives to do a spiritual health check? Except for the time we spend in church on Sunday, do we invite God into the decisions we make? Do we pray? Do we give thanks? Jesus loved the man who asked the question, and love is demanding. Sell what you have, give to the poor. We don't really know until the end of the story that this man had many possessions. So is it his wealth that is the stumbling block for him? He went away grieving, the text tells us. If he had asked another question, a different question, or if he had stayed with Jesus in his shock and sadness, would Jesus' love for him have called him to a new way of life or a reorienting of his dependence upon his possessions? Giving away all that he had was what seemed to grieve him. We know that a reasonable reading of this text is with a focus on how one uses one's wealth. Another is to broaden our understanding of possessions beyond money. If it were in fact only the rich who had to face this encounter with Jesus, many of us could sigh in relief change nothing about our lives, and assume God's unconditional love for us would save us at the end. 
The man loved his possessions more than his relationship with Jesus. This story, then, is about anything that separates us from God. This is where my probing of the text ended the last time I preached on it. It might have been true this time, too, except that I used an additional source. And in the telling of the story in that source, the word I in the text was italicized. That, for me, changed so much. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Inheritance can only be given. In the world we live in, we are required, it seems, to depend upon ourselves, to build our own future, to take pride in the security and comfort we feel. And we forget that nothing we do, nothing we have, can assure our salvation. We are saved only by God's grace. The disciples ask, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Our indigenous ancestors understood that nothing belonged to them that everything was borrowed and would be returned. The earth was their teacher, protected and revered. When we worship, we are living in God's presence. Through our liturgy, we hear the stories of our ancestors, we practice community, we remember Christ's death and resurrection, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and we are sent into the world changed. There is tension, no doubt, between the lives we live in this world and what God requires of us. Just as the rich young man in the gospel and the disciples, over and over, we can ask the wrong question. But we can also admit our vulnerability, we can profess our faith, hold fast to the one who loves us, seek justice, show mercy, and hope in the God who will save us. Be empowered, not by your possessions, but by your faith, and tell your story.